This presentation is the first of several covering the skeletal system, which is Chapter 5. Now, what we're going to talk about today is uh, parts of the skeletal system, which consists of more than what you might think. Uh, we imagine the skeletal system as just being bones, but the fact is it contains all of the joints and materials that make up the joints, the cartilages, ligaments, and other materials that hold the skeletal system together. Um, the skeletal system consists of two subdivisions. There is the axial skeleton, which is the stuff that's in the middle. Um, that includes the skull, the vertebrae, um, it contains the rib cage, and part of the pelvis, uh, the sacrum, uh, doesn't contain other parts of the hip pelvis, uh, the hip bones. That's actually part of the appendicular skeleton. Appendicular skeleton is associated with movement. Um, so that includes the arms, um, it includes the girdles that hold the arms in place, like the clavicle and scapula, and it includes um, the bones of the pelvis, the hip bones. The functions of bones, there's quite a few actually. First, they support the body. It is a rigid structure that allows us to protect soft organs, um, including those uh, the lungs, the heart, the brain, the spinal cord. It allows movement because we can attach muscles to these rigid structures, and by pulling with the muscles, we can cause the bones to change position. It's a store for minerals and fats, specifically calcium. As we'll learn later on, calcium is a critical element in the function of the wrist, or I'm sorry, of the um, muscular system, the nervous system, and it's important for us to be able to have blood to clot. So it's a very important element for us, and when we don't have enough in our bloodstream, we can pull that out of bone. Uh, additionally, there is fat that's within bone. Uh, it's not very much but it is an energy source that can give us a little bit for a short period of time. Finally, um, the bones are associated in blood cell formation, uh, known as hematopoiesis. We're talking about the formation of all types of blood cells. We're talking about the white cells, we're talking about the platelets, the red cells. So bone is critical in that function. Now, <coughs> The skeleton itself, the adult skeleton, has 206 bones. And um, the fetal skeleton, uh, and the newborn skeleton, actually has more than that. Um, but several of these bones fuse over time to become one structure. We'll be dealing with those of the adult. And the bones have two basic configurations. We have compact bone, which is dense and homogeneous, and has as its uh, structural unit something called an osteon, which we'll look at a little later on. Spongy bone is surrounded by compact bone. It is the stuff that's inside of compact bone. If you see bone, generally what you're looking at is the compact, but within it we have these little needle-like projections, uh, they're called trabeculi, and there's lots of open space in there in which um, we can have red bone marrow form. Now, these trabeculi serve to lighten the bone, and additionally, the way that these things uh, form, they are along stress lines. So it's very much like the um, supporting struts in, say, buildings like gymnasiums. Uh, if you look up, they have these little triangular strut uh, structures that are much lighter than a solid beam and um, actually add strength and because they are structured the way they are, if there is a damage to one part of the strut, the strut will still hold in place, whereas if it were solid and a crack developed, that crack could propagate all the way through. So the spongy bone does a lot of things for us. Now, we classify bones based on shape. Um, there are long bones and flat bones, 
irregular bones and short bones. And there are a couple of minor types, uh, sesamoid bones, which make up the patella, and one called a wormian bone. And we have just various numbers of wormian bones. They are little tiny bones that form as the plates are closing uh, in our skull. And so they're you know, maybe grain of sand to BB size. Anyway, the structure of these long bones are typically longer than they are wide. They have a shaft with a head at both ends. Um, they contain mostly compact bone with spongy bones on the ends, and the ends are known as the epiphysis. Now, long bones are associated with movement. So we're talking the femur, the humerus, other bones of the arm, even the fingers are considered long bones. There is a graphic example of a long bone, uh, this being the humerus of the arm. Now, short bones are generally cube-shaped, and they contain mostly spongy bone with a little thin layer of compact bone on the outer surface. These are approximately as long as they are wide, about the same thickness, so they're more or less cube-shaped. Um, examples of these are the carpals of the wrist, and of which we have eight in each wrist, and the tarsals of the foot, which we have eight of those as well. Here's a graphic example to show you. These bones in red are our carpals, and those would all be considered uh, cuboidal. Flat bones are thin plates. Um, they are usually curved, like the bones of the skull. Uh, two thin plates of compact bone that surround a layer of spongy bone, and examples of that. You see here a section of the skull, but the ribs and the sternum would also be considered flat bones. In fact, as you see here, the sternum is viewed as a flat bone. Irregular bones have a lot of lumps and bumps and projections coming off of them. Um, these are muscle attachments or openings for things to pass through. Um, they don't really fit into other bone classifications, and examples of those include the vertebrae, which, uh, as we were looking in lab, you saw, have lots of little um, spinous processes and transverse processes and foramina. Hip bones are another example of these irregular bones. And as you can see here, you've got this body structure, you've got the spinous process, transverse processes, all of this stuff that's coming off of this, so we couldn't really classify it as one shape or another. So, the questions so far that you need to be looking at are, what are the parts of the skeleton? Now, what makes it up? Um, we mentioned bones, cartilage, ligaments, and so forth. And what are the functions of bone? We listed several, and you should be able to identify those. But what are the divisions of the skeletal system? We talked about axial and appendicular. You should know what those mean. How many bones do we have? You know, understand, 206 bones in the adult uh, skeleton. And give the types of bone. We mentioned they are based on different shapes. You should be able to identify the shapes and give the examples that were listed. Now, as we move on, <coughs> we'll start talking about the anatomy of a long bone. We mentioned before that it has a shaft, which is composed of compact bone. That shaft is referred to as the diaphysis. Now, the ends of the bone we call the epiphysis. Um, these, again, have mostly spongy bone, but they still have compact bone on the outside. So, if you were to look at a long bone, it would look something like this. You see we've got compact bone through here. We have a hollow area here. And then we have, at the ends, spongy bone. Now, bones, and it doesn't matter whether it's long bones or short bones or anything else, bones are covered with 
a material called periosteum. This is a connective tissue layer that surrounds the bone. Uh, blood supply is attached to the bone via the periosteum. The cells that are involved in building and repairing bone are located in the periosteum. It is made of fibrous connective tissue and has some fibers that will secure it to the underlying bone. Um, it is kind of parchment thin. Uh, if I give my dog a bone to chew on, it will eventually peel off this little thin layer of tissue on the surface, and that's the periosteum. Now, aside from the things that we just mentioned, periosteum also helps um, the bone form its shape. On the periosteum, we have arteries, which are held to the surface, and they perforate into the shaft of the bone, which helps supply bone cells with nutrients. So the bone actually has a pretty good blood supply, even though as a connective tissue, most of it is non-living. Um, this is important because bones get damaged, bones break, and you need to have a good su blood supply for repair to take place. This is an example. You see the periosteum, which is this tissue on the outside. And one thing that we didn't mention earlier is that there is a similar lining on the inside of the bone called the endosteum. And the cavity on the inside of the bone is the medullary cavity. And that is misspelled, my bad, that should be N-E-D-U-L-L-A-R-Y. Um, on the ends of long bone, we have articular cartilage. We have this on the ends of all long bone. This is a highline cartilage, which is a very nice um, glassy kind of tissue. It has no blood supply whatsoever. Um, it does have cells in it. And it decreases the friction at joint surfaces. If you've ever boiled chicken and found that kind of rubbery material at the end of the bone, that is the articular cartilage. Mm. Um, now, bones actually form, or bone forms, from cartilage. And in long bones, to allow the bone to grow in length, there is a band of cartilage called the epithelial plate. Um, we see this in young growing bone. Now, once uh, the, there's kind of a race going on, there is cartilage being built, and then cartilage being replaced by bone. And it's just uh, the bone moves just a little bit faster, moves just a little bit faster than the cartilage does. So. At some point in puberty, the development of um, bone catches up and bone doesn't grow in length anymore. But you can tell if that has happened yet or not radiographically because this epithelial plate will show as a dark line on an x ray. The epithelial line is the place where the epithelial plate used to be and it has been replaced with compact bone. So it shows up as a light line on x-rays. The relevance of this is that um, if a child is uh, of small stature, for instance, um, the x-ray can be taken of a bone, can just be a finger bone, but if that epithelial plate is still intact, then it is possible for growth to continue. And the doctor might, in fact, prescribe uh, some sort of growth hormone to allow the child to grow. And this is where the epithelial line is. It used to be the epithelial plate. It's sometimes referred to as the growth plate. But radiographically, this is what we see. And if you'll notice here, there's a dark band in both of these areas. That is the epithelial plate. Uh, this is um, the tibia, this is the femur. This person has the potential to grow and be taller. On the other hand, this is an adult. 
and you see now that we have a white line here and a white line here. And that means that that plate is closed and there is no additional growth that's going to happen in that particular joint. We talked about the medullary cavity before. It is the cavity that's inside the shaft of the long bone. And it contains yellow marrow, which is mostly fat um, in adults. Now, if a per an adult breaks a bone, they will often uh, expose this yellow marrow. And about one out of ten times, they can get something called a fatty embolism. That is, uh, a kind of a roving droplet of fat that gets into the bloodstream. And that fatty embolism can block blood vessels. It can lead to heart attacks and strokes and uh, respiratory problems. So as we age, um, unfortunately, we are more likely to have a fall and break a bone. And it is quite common for a person to have a fall break a bone and have a stroke within a very short period of time of one another. Now, the ends the end contain red bear marrow for blood formation um, in adults. The medullary cavity also has red marrow in infants. So, infants need more blood. This um, is replaced by the yellow marrow uh, fairly early on. If I were to ask where or what was in the medullary cavity, I am looking for fat, uh, unless I specify that it's in children. We generally are talking about adult normal anatomy in this class. And again, you can see here the medullary cavity, the epithelial plate, and the spongy bone. I'm going to stop at this point. Um, and we will pick up on additional characteristics of bone in a second uh, presentation. Thank you.